me and his charming smile. Instead, I will be forever haunted by visions of his frantic and impossible attempts to cry out for his life through a severed windpipe. I have been beside Travis's five siblings since his death in 2008, and while offering emotional support, we've lived together sharing a rented home in Arizona throughout the guilt phase and both penalty phases. Along with the rest of our family, I have suffered great sorrow and pain during these trials. We have heard countless indignities and unfounded accusations that have besmirched Travis's good name, reputation, and moral character. I have seen heinous pictures of my nephew, which I will never be able to erase from my mind. My residence is in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I have spent countless hours and substantial amounts of money commuting back and forth to the trial. I found it necessary to step down from my position as a Starbucks store manager so I could dedicate my time and support to my nieces and nephew out throughout this trial, which now has been ongoing for over two years. The events resulting from the slaughter of my nephew have entirely overshadowed the relationship I have with my nuclear family. Over the past nearly seven years, I have missed numerous events and family outings that I can never replace, and my marriage has also suffered. All of us, my husband, my children, my nieces, my nephew, and myself, will never be the people we were before June 4th, 2008, when Jody Arias savagely murdered my nephew, Travis Alexander. We all have a deep and unending sadness, which will be with us the rest of our lives. We have problems relating to our significant others and our friends who have never experienced such a senseless and horrific death of a loved one. We will never again be able to look at family photos of Travis and not think of his butchered, nearly decapitated body left to rot. Judge Stevens, I humbly implore you to sentence this unrepentant murderer to the maximum sentence of natural life, so she will never, ever again have that opportunity to destroy more innocent lives like she did to us and to Travis. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. The uh, next person to speak is Hillary Wilcox. She is Mr. Alexander's sister. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Hillary Wilcox. I'm Travis's little sister. I loved my brother very much, and I miss him so much. Travis was not only my brother, but we were really close friends. I looked up to him. When we got married, my family didn't have a lot of money, and he willingly paid for part of it. My dad was not alive at that time also. And so instead of having a daddy-daughter dance, I had my dance with him. <laughs> Travis and I had many of the same goals. He wanted to get married. He wanted a family. I, ha I am married. And I have a family. A family that my brother never got to meet. My brother actually never knew that I was going to be able to have kids because I was having major difficulties having kids. He never gets to meet my, my children. It devastates me that my kids will never get to play with his kids and they can't grow up together. Throughout all this, many other people have told me that I have been so strong that I've handled this with grace. And I feel that I have. I've been blessed to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that no doubt my faith has helped me through this. I 
like I said, I have a family. I'm a mother, and I had to be strong. I couldn't let this affect my family. I couldn't let this affect my kids or let it affect my marriage. But none of this has been easy for me. With great sacrifice and pain to myself, I've done my best to block my brother from my life. I don't want to remember him anymore. Because it hurts too much to remember him alive. Because if I remember him, I remember how he was brutally taken from us. And I can't handle it. This is what I've had to do so I can cope. So I can handle it. I hate that she has taken my past of my brother and also my future. Memories of him. I do have moments of weakness. And most of the time during those weaknesses I'm in the shower. I know it's because that's where she she killed him. So I have to shake it out of my head and quickly get out of the shower. Just Stevens. I know you've seen the pain that she put my brother through. And how she smeared his name falsely. And I hope that you've seen the pain that she put our family through. And I hope that you can give her the back sentence that you possibly can give her because she deserves nothing more. And I thank you for that consideration. Thank you for your statement. Mr. Martinez. Next to address the court is Tanisha Sorensen. Good morning, Chip Steven. Good morning. My name is Tanisha Sorensen, as I'm sure you know by now. I am one of Travis's little sisters, the one closest in age to him. I've been here every single day on this painstaking trial, just as you have. So I'm sure you know this is no easy task. Every single day that I've sat here has been very painful and wearing on my spirit. Viewing my brother's autopsy photos, hearing the lies, has just been about all I can take. I didn't choose to be here. I didn't ask to be here. But I'm here for one reason only, and that's to seek justice for my beautiful, sweet, caring, amazing brother. I didn't want to be the girl whose brother was brutally murdered. I didn't want to sit here, day in and day out, hearing the details of my brother's body being tortured. I didn't ask for my life and that of my siblings to be put on blast by every social media network and on every news channel. I didn't want to turn on the TV and watch my family suffering and seeing myself suffer because of the actions of pure evil. I see the pain in our faces and the tears we've cried, and it never stops. My family has had to deal with the torment and agony that she has caused, and we will for the rest of our lives. I've continually been harassed by a small group of people 
that in my mind are just as evil as the one who has done this. These people support her actions and send me a picture of my brother's dead body and his autopsy photos, his blackened face and his slip throat to my email on my Facebook page. These same people said they were going to stand outside the courthouse today to harass me and my family, all because we are fighting for justice for our brother Travis. I did not ever think we would be victimized over and over again just for coming here and wanting justice for a man I loved and cared about. A man who was my brother and my protector. A man who deserved to be living now as I speak. Travis Victor Alexander should be alive today. And I shouldn't have to be here today begging for justice to be served and handed down. This person who has decided to take the role of God needs to suffer the consequences of her own actions. She has come up with lie after lie, more stories and then new stories. Travis should have died a much, in a much later life, long after he became a husband, a father, a grandfather, and maybe even a great-grandfather. He should have been able to see the thousand and one places that he dreamed of seeing, but instead he was brutally murdered by a jealous, obsessive person that decided for herself that if she couldn't have him, nobody else would. This person who once said she couldn't think of anyone that didn't love Travis, that if she killed Travis, she would beg for the death penalty. The one who wrote in her journal that the person who did this sickening crime deserved a needle in their arm. What happened to that? What happened to that, Jody? This road to recovery and repair our family is going on will continue. It doesn't end here. I just want to leave this courtroom in Arizona <laughs> and this evil that sits in this room behind me. I want to remember my brother, Travis Victor Alexander, as a man he was, a man of service, a man of love and inspiration, a man of God, a man who cared so much for others. I want to lay my head down at night knowing his murderer will pay for his senseless murder at, at Perryville Prison for the rest of her life, please. I have prayed every single day before court that she would just come clean and tell the truth. Stop murdering my brother again and again by smearing his name. That she would just tell the truth. I hope, I'll hope that she would have some remorse. <laughs> but she has shown no mercy on Travis nor our family. And what I'm asking of you, Judge Stephen, is to please don't spare her any mer mercy in her sins today. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. And last, Samantha Alexander. Good morning. Good morning. I gave an impact statement at the first penalty phase on behalf of my entire family. That statement was extremely filtered due to the rules of speaking to the jury. With that being said, the statement is more personal to me in my experience and a little less filtered. I wanted to start out by talking about the last day I saw Travis. Towards the end of May of 2008, just a couple of weeks before Travis was killed, he came to visit me in my home in Southern California. He was so excited to let me read the intro to his book that he was writing titled, Raising You. This was his attempt to inspire and help more people to become the best person they could be, no matter who they are or where they came from. The intro to the book detailed our childhood, what we overcame, 
how we would not change a single thing about it. Travis and I got in a deep conversation about our life, our crazy childhood, the horrible, unexpected deaths we endured, including both of our parents at a young age. We both agreed that no matter how miserable our lives were at times, our childhood is what made us who we are. Our childhood made us strong and able to conquer almost anything. Our childhood gave us no choice but to rise above our surroundings, change the cycle, and become successful. Travis made the best of the cards he was dealt and became a successful motivational speaker. He wanted to share with the world that you can do anything despite your surroundings. You can be anything you want to be. That was the sole purpose of his book. My brother shared the sad details of our childhood to help others. He exposed private details of our lives growing up to make difference and motivate others in theirs. I am disgusted that Jody used his words of encouragement, the words that he wanted to use to help others that were struggling to assist her in her absolutely ridiculous defense. Ironically, before Travis left my house that day, we got into a crazy discussion about the, death, the deaths we've endured at such a young age. We both shared the fear of losing another family member. It made me so sick to my stomach to even imagine going through another death. I told him I probably couldn't handle it, and he said the same. That was the last time I saw him. I think back about that last conversation we had about death. I think about how horrible and sick I got when we were talking about it. Little did I know, just a couple of weeks later, my entire life would be turned upside down. This is one of the worst possible things I can imagine. The day I found out about Travis's death was the morning of June 10th. I was on a river trip with my boyfriend and best friends in Parker, Arizona. I checked my voicemail because I had bad reception on the water and we were getting ready to take the boat out. The first message was my little sister, Hillary. She sang some funny song and I was busting up laughing. The next message was my grandmother. My heart sank into my stomach and I immediately had a burning sensation in my gut. She said, Samantha, you need to call me. It's very important. I recognized her tone of voice from before when I knew somebody was dead. I called my grandmother's house and Tanisha answered the phone. She screamed. She said, Samantha, Travis is dead. I could barely breathe out the words, what happened? And nobody knew. She said he was found in the bedroom and the police couldn't provide any details. I was on the verge of puking. I couldn't believe my own ears. I remember hoping I'd wake up from a horrible nightmare, but I wasn't sleeping, and the nightmare was real. After several hours of waiting, I found out that Travis had been murdered and that he had been shot and stabbed several times. I was sick. I could barely breathe. I kept thinking, how could this happen? What monster would do this to him? We packed up and left the river immediately. My boyfriend drove me to Mesa because I was too out of my mind to drive myself. I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. I kept thinking, who would do this? Who would do this? Why Travis? And why my family again? It was the worst feeling of my entire life. It was worse than all the other deaths combined. I felt so hopeless. Could not believe that there was Someone out there, roaming free, that committed this heinous crime against my brother. I started calling friends of Travis's, asking questions. Everyone said the same thing. Travis didn't have enemies. The only person they could think of was his stalking ex-girlfriend, Jody. All fingers pointed to her. I remember who she was because Travis called me, asking law enforcement advice. I believe that Jody... He said he believed that Jody slashed his tires twice in two different locations. After remembering that, it completely clicked in my head, and I knew in my heart, within a matter of hours of finding out about Travis's death, 
that Jody was the one that murdered my brother. We arrived to Mesa late on June 10th. After three days of waiting, we got a call that the crime scene was cleared and we were allowed to enter Travis's home. I remember being so sick to my stomach knowing I was about to walk into the place my brother was brutally murdered in. We walked in the front door, everything looked pretty normal. We started to walk up towards Travis's bedroom and I could barely breathe. My poor little sister, Hillary, couldn't even go in the room. I remember the first step I made in his room, reality set in. I immediately noticed a large piece of carpet missing from the floor. I saw a hole cut into the wall in the hallway leading to his master bathroom. I looked down the hallway, knowing where the shower was, and my heart sank. My stomach started burning, my ears started ringing, and I could barely hear. My mind immediately started to paint a picture of what happened the day that my brother was brutally murdered. I was so sick. I was standing in the same exact place the horrific fight took place. I could imagine the pain, the agony, the screams, and the fright that my brother was going through. What was going through his head when he was losing the fight of his life. I walked down that bathroom hall where, where it was obvious the main crime scene occurred. And I looked at the shower where I knew he was found. My eyes filled with tears and I instantly started picturing my poor brother's dead body in the shower. He was there for five days. Five days he was there decomposing in the shower. I'm sure his soul was screaming for someone to find him. It made me so sick to think that I was having the time of my life at the river while my poor brother lay dead in the shower. After regrouping, we started to pack up the house. We packed up for three days straight. I remember when it would get dark, we were scared someone was going to come back and try to attack us. We were so scared of our own shadows, but we finally got it done. Travis's friends had a memorial for him before we left town. It was amazing. There were hundreds of people there that loved Travis. So many came up to my sister Hillary and I and gave us huge hugs, hugs saying how sorry they were and told us what an amazing brother we had. One person at the memorial stood out like a sore thumb. I recognized her from pictures that Travis had showed me before. It was Jody. She had that evil smirk on her face that's similar to her looking photo. I remember getting the chills because she was within a few feet of me and I suspected that she did it. It made me feel so helpless. Deep down I knew that she killed my brother and I couldn't do anything about it. I didn't want to go to jail or hell because of what she did. So I put my faith in the justice system. On July 15, 2008, 36 days after we found out about my brother's death, 42 days after he was murdered, I received a phone call from Detective Flores. He told me that he had arrested Jody for the murder of my brother. It was the worst weight of our lives, not knowing if anyone was ever going to get arrested for what happened, not knowing if we were next to be attacked, not knowing anything except the horrible injuries my brother sustained and how he must have suffered. I feel so sorry for anyone that has ever walked or will ever walk in those shoes. I had a sense of relief due to the arrest and a sense of rage. I found out that what I suspected all along was correct. I cannot believe that not only did she do this to my brother and left him there to rot, not only did she act as if she had no idea, she had the audacity to go to his memorial in Mesa with a smirk on her emotionless face as if she was envying her work. This person had the nerve to send my grandmother flowers two days after Travis was found, expressing what a good man my brother was and how sorry she was for our family. She had the nerve to write my family a letter on Travis's 31st birthday, the first birthday he didn't get to celebrate. She explained how sorry she was. She wrote about what a great man my brother was and how she owed him his, her life. She described the bandit story in full detail. She expressed so much remorse about not being able to save Travis, defeat those evil monsters, and for leaving him there to die. 
She explained that they threatened to kill her and her family. That she called the police. She claimed she was wrongly accused, and the real monsters are still re that are responsible for this heinous crime are still out there, and that they needed to be brought to justice. She said these monsters deserve the death penalty. If there is one thing I can agree with Jody on in that letter, is that the monster responsible for this, the monster that did this to my brother, deserves the death penalty. I have not had a good night's sleep since my brother was murdered. The endless trial made us hear the graphic details of the murder over and over. The images of my poor brother's dead body will never go away. The justice system has completely failed us over and over. It disgusts me how many rights the defendant has. The victim's rights are a joke in comparison. With that being said, I understand the decisions you made in this trial. I understand why you allowed the delays by the defense. I have seen the public backlash because of it. I am so sorry that you had to go through this experience, not only once, but twice. After the hung jury of the first trial, if there was an option for you to sentence Jody to life row, where Jody would have been treated like a death row inmate for the rest of her life, we would have taken that. The option should be there in a case of a hung jury in a death penalty case. That option would have also eliminated the chance for a tainted juror getting on the jury the second time around. Judges should have the power to sentence life row. It would have spared us all the time, money, and additional suffering to be here. We attempted to plea with Jody by sparing the death penalty and trade for natural life and no appeals. She would not budge. That is the only reason we all had to go through this again. I know that we, are, we have the right to address the defendant directly. Jody has shown no remorse. She continuously makes atrocious lies about my brother, dragging his name through the mud after she dragged his body through his own, his own blood. She stooped so low as to throw her own mother and father under the bus, knowing damn well she was never abused, just to spare her own life. I wouldn't waste my time addressing her, because she isn't worth my breath. In closing, I just want to express my appreciation to you. I know this trial has impacted your life. There is only one person to blame for that, and that is Jody. I thank you, Judge Stevens, for being strong enough to see this trial to the end. I know how difficult the decision is to make, and I pray that you will make the right one by sentencing Jody to natural life without the possibility of parole. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. The uh, state does not have anybody else who wishes to address the court. Mr. Martinez, do you want to make a statement at this time? I um, would prefer to make it after I hear what the defendant have to, has to say, but if you want, I will make it right now. I'll approach, please. <laughs> Mr. Martinez, you may proceed. Hope is uh, never a bad thing. Uh, hope is always a good thing. And in this case, the family of Travis Alexander, as you heard, hoped that a death sentence would be imposed in this case. But that is not to be. That will not happen. And in speaking to them, at certain junctures, they take some solace in the fact that the jury, the jury, 
11 to 1, deadlocked in favor of imposing the death penalty. To them, that provides a small measure of solace. But it's a very small measure of solace because generally, as you see, normally, as you heard, they always, always feel that death is the appropriate sentence. But even though they feel that death is the appropriate sentence, they still have hope. They have hope now that you'll see your way to a natural life sentence. And they believe that a natural life sentence is appropriate not because they want to be vindictive, but because, as you have also seen, what happened in that bedroom or bathroom of that bedroom was a butchering. When they, as they told me, when they think, and they've also told you, when they think of the stabbing, they can feel their brother's pain. They feel the blade going into him, and it burns them, and they cry, and they don't know what to do about it just like Travis Alexander didn't know what to do about it. And when they feel him moving away, trying to get away from the defendant as she continually stabbed him, they can hear his cries. They can hear him screaming. It rings in their ears, and it's something that they cannot stop. It's something that they, even though they want to sleep, even though they may want to turn away from it. It is something that rings in their mind. It's cries. They know that these are the agonized cries of a wounded animal who's about to be killed. And that's how they think of it. They also can't help feeling as he crawled away down the hallway. And it's something that they hope that he was unconscious when she took that knife for the last time. They hope that he's unconscious. But based on what they see or what they saw in this court, they know that he wasn't. They know that he was still alive. They knew that he was still feeling after he had crawled all the way down the hallway and came down to the carpet. They knew he was still conscious when the defendant took that knife and slashed his throat wide open. And that almost makes them crazy to think that their brother had suffered so many stab wounds and then as a coup de grace they have him feel that blade one last time and at that point they are thankful that he wasn't feeling anymore but what they can't get out of their mind is the brutality as she dragged him back down the hallway and put a bullet in his head. And so they live with this every day. They live with the extreme cruelty of this killing. They live with the extreme distress that their brother must have felt during that, those minutes that it took for this to happen. To them, it was an eternity. They weren't there. But to them, they know that their brother suffered any, enough for an eternity. And so, because of that, they have hope. And they have hope, as I said, they have, they have hope that you, remember, that you will remember that when pondering what sentence is the most appropriate in this case. And I know that there's a sentencing memorandum that has been proposed to you, letting out a request for the alternative sentence. And I know that in that sentencing memorandum, they ask you to conduct a comparative analysis with other cases. But you didn't sit and listen in all, to the evidence in all of those cases. You are the person who sat and listened to the evidence, every single bit of evidence in this case. You know about every single stab wound. You know about all of the blood. And you know all about the gunshot. Those other cases, 
but nothing more than ink on paper, something for you to read. So I ask you to take a look at this case and make a decision based on what you see and what you saw and heard in this courtroom. The other thing that they are hopeful of is that when you consider the issue of remorse, because that's the other issue that continues to haunt the victims, because they truly are victims, as you have seen, even though they didn't themselves personally suffer uh, the wounds, they didn't suffer the stab wounds, they didn't suffer the gunshot, they are still suffering. And one of the things that they want you to consider is the defendant's request that you find that somehow she is remorseful in this case. They hope that you will remember that from one side of her mouth she was saying what an influential and great person Travis Alexander was. And out of the other side of her mouth was calling him a pedophile was saying things that are almost too difficult to talk about. But not only did she talk about it, she went even further. And as you know, she even fabricated evidence to try to bring her point home to you. Objection, Judge. Overruled. <clears throat> she provided it for your consideration. And it's something that the next of kin is aware of, and it's something that haunts them. They mentioned it to you previously when they addressed you, this issue of Mr. Alexander being a pedophile. And so they, something that, out of one side of her mouth, talks about what a great individual she was, yet, and yet she's so remorseful about it, yet she can stab him figuratively throughout this whole trial, stabbing him with the only thing that he has left, stabbing him to take away the only thing he has left, which was his character. Talked about how much of an individual he was who was involved in this sexual activities. How they talked to you about that he had been to these websites hundreds of times, these porn websites. All of this stuff is something that they want you to consider when you think about what they have proposed to you as mitigation, and specifically this issue of whether or not the defendant is remorseful. They do not believe that the defendant is remorseful, and they hope that you see it that way also. There are some other issues that were presented here in the sentencing memorandum, specifically one of them being that the defendant is mentally ill. Well. You heard the testimony from all of the witnesses, including Janine DeMarte, and you know what the explanation for that is. There's no need to go over that again, and it is not a mitigating factor. They also specifically mentioned things such as no previous criminal history and no propensity for violence. Well, you also heard the evidence that was presented in this case, and you also know what happened uh, back at the address with Mr. Alexander. There's no need to go on any further other than to point out that the next of kin, Travis Alexander's family, is still hopeful. They're hopeful that you will sentence the defendant to natural life. And they see it that way because of everything they have felt everything they have seen, all the photographs that have been presented in this case. The state also has been present. The state is also hopeful. Hopeful that you follow the recommendation of the victims. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take a 10-minute recess to review the letters submitted by the defendant.